Okay, it's four or five. So, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm George Barbastatis. Uh, it is my honor today to be the, the host for, uh, for Professor Kohler's uh, seminar. So, uh, Matthias, as we all call him, uh, Matthias, um, is working on uh, the identification of unique biological light manipulation concepts and the development of bio-inspired dynamic photonic materials and devices. He joined us at MIT in uh, November 2013. Before that, he had the Theodore Linen, eh? Linen Research Fellowship uh, of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation uh, and uh, as a postdoc at, at uh, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard, uh, also working on uh, bio-inspired photonics, bioimaging and optical spectroscopy. And before that, uh, he earned a PhD from Univers University of Cambridge in 2010. And before that, you want me to really say that? <laughs> okay, before, before that in 2006, he, he earned um, an undergraduate uh, degree in physics from Zaaland University and University of Lorraine in France. He's holding the Rockwell Career Development Chair uh, in our department, received the Brigham and Women's Innovator Award for his group's innovations on colorimetric pressure uh, sensing in compression bandages uh, in 2018. And his group's work was featured in the special issue on highlights in optics in 2018 in the OSA um, Optics and Photonics News uh, magazine. He sent me a lot of interesting, uh, interesting uh, trivia to, to tell you. I chose only one to convey, which is that um, at least one of uh, our junior faculty uh, colleagues uh, would nominate Matthias for, uh, let me try to pronounce it correctly. Uh, nominate Matthias for a gets you out of uncomfortable situations without thinking twice award or the most awesome and free spirited group atmosphere award, which is remarkable. And, and um, being honored to be a friend of Matthias, I attest that these qualities are absolutely true. So without further ado, I will uh, pass the stage to Matthias, uh, who's going to talk to us today about spreading light to see, seeing butterflies grow scales, and scaling colors to stretch. Matthias? George, thank you. Ready? George, thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay, I see, I see George nodding. And yes. I see <laughs> hands up from, from Anthony and Ben. Actually, Anthony and Ben, my uh, two senior credit students, are also on the panel. Um, because a lot of the work that I want to show is their work. Um, and um, since we are not in a lecture hall and I can't really point them out here and make silly jokes to get them plush, I thought I'd bring them at least on the panel. And hopefully you'll get a view of them a little bit later. <clears throat> okay, uh, spreading light to see, seeing butterflies grow scales and scaling colors to stretch. Um, you might see in the title that this implies quite a couple of different topics that I'm going to juggle today. And before I start with that, let me first get the big picture out of the way. The big picture is that colors make the world amazing. And that is certainly true for this class of purple fluid that I hold in my hand. And no, it's not wine. I'm not going to get hammered in front of you just yet, uh, but it's blueberry juice. And you can see how beautiful that color is. And here are little sort of guys that make that. Uh, and they're looking the part because they have pigmentation. Now, what is an organism to do that does not have pigmentation? For example, like this blue ray limpet here. Well, its trick to be blue, bright in its stripes, is to use structure. Uh, the secret sauce is my material structure on the micro and nanoscale. And if you believe in light being a wave, and the goal is to shape and filter or redirect that wave, then what matters most is material structure, I'd like to argue. And my group's contribution to light manipulation is actually to understand how material structure in nature is used to create interesting light manipulation concepts. And then we're trying to come up with clever tricks ourselves like for example, in these fluid emulsions where we create shiny colors or in these fibers uh, where we can change their colors as we stretch them all by control of the micro and nanostructure. So that's sort of the playing ground. And on that playing ground, we are juggling quite a few different interests. So I don't know if that video is playing without uh, interruption for you or if it's choppy, uh, but that's me juggling quite a few balls. I will attest to the fact that I can juggle three very well. Um, and if this is choppy for you, I'm not cheating here. Um, but what we are juggling in my uh, research group is unique light manipulation strategies in nature and combined with our interest in soft and fluid matter. And we're interested in soft and fluid matter because you can squish and deform these materials. And that helps us to build balanced biodynamic optical materials and devices. So that's the playing ground. 
that we are working in. And on the map for today in this playing field, um, there is three different topics I want to touch on. Uh, the first one is a bio-inspired imaging concepts. And the general takeaway for you and the audience is that when we study nature's night manipulation concepts, it's actually having sometimes really good um, purposes for new technology. It's fun, but it's also useful. Um, then we want to look into a butterfly to see crows at work. The takeaway there for you is to understand how structure formation happens, we need to see it happening. If you don't see it, you can't understand how it works in some cases. And the third one, that's the final topic for the talk today, is the enlightened formation of light manipulating structures at scale. And the takeaway here, tongue in cheek, is there's really no reason why we are not all wearing color changing spandex. So, for the first topic, the balance by imaging concept, I have to take you back about 10 years to my PhD in Professor Ulrich Steiner's lab. Uh, at the time, Uli was a professor at the University of Cambridge, and now he is one of the chairs in the Adolf Merkel Institute at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. In Uli's lab, I studied this papillo butterfly. And what's, what's really amazing is to look at what makes these green spots on its wings. It's a rainbow of colors on its scales, and this rainbow of colors comes from a multi-layer architecture that's curved. It has very interesting effects on the light, there's polarization, there's filtering, you get different colors. We understand this very nicely, this color mixing effect, and then we worked to actually emulate it in a very close fashion. And we created samples, artificial samples, with identical optical behavior. We ultimately found that we can improve on that design to build a reflective optical surface with traumatic and very discontinuous color changes. And this is a feature that we thought could be really useful in security printing applications. Now, all of this is optically passive, and that means that we need light in the environment to see this. Um, and so as time passed for me, I was wondering what would happen if we combine this simply with a bit of active material. So now, inspiration from nature can lead to interesting ideas. Also, I also have to admit that not every idea starts out as a good one. So here is my first take on what we could do with these butterfly structures and a bit of active materials. And it's, I think, fair to admit that was a pretty underbaked idea. Um, maybe the butterfly concavities could make a good array of coherently interacting microlasers. Now, this idea was taken up by a really motivated, very bright visiting student, Cecilia Chasseau, who is now a PhD student in John Hart's loop, uh, lab in, at, in McGill MIT. And this turned into a very nice project with a smart change of perspective. And that's the reason why I can tell you about this today. Now, here are we trying to make microcavity lasers. And when I say we, it's really Cecile who's making them. She's very creative and she conceived and perfected this wild process, which is a combination of casting and templating and also evaporative material assembly and feature assembly and deposition. Now we see out the top left, uh, bottom left here, I should say, um, maybe I can show you that even with my pen. You see the structure as it's made. Uh, we have this micro patterned concave bottom reflector, like in the butterfly. The, uh, the middle is actually a quantum dot containing polymethylate layer. A polymer layer, and then on top we have a bracket reflector. And on the right, you just see an optical micrograph of the structure in top view, how it emits light. Um, that's a spatial pattern. Now, did we get this to lace? No, um, but we saw this. We saw that this structure emits a hollow cone of light. And this hollow cone of light is here shown on the left schema schematically. And on the right, we show these donut type images. And these are images of the back focal plane of our objective that we focus onto the sample. And in the back focal plane of the objective, you can actually see a Fourier space representation of the sample. And that is akin to showing us the directions of light propagation. So when you read this, uh, the center of this image is light that comes out of the surface perpendicularly, uh, parallel to the surface normal. And as you go along to higher and higher polar angles, uh, you, would, you would actually see the light that comes out at, at uh, bigger angles. Now, let me make a small digression. Um, if you, wonder, if you wonder why we didn't get this to lace, um, one of the biggest reasons is that at the time when we saw this behavior, I spoke the language of quantum dot lasing just about as much as I speak Russian. Uh, and that's not very well at all. Um, but on very rare occasions, ignorance can be a bit of a bliss if you pair it and balance it with an eye for perspective. And so here, let me show you this pictorial digression on this slide. Um, it's a thrilling and very adventurous moment out under the blue sky, and you're going close up to the wind on this very adequately named sleek Russian vessel. Its name, Serot Nevda, really encompasses all of what that scene conveys, whether you're mastering language or not. Provided you just look at this word with the right perspective, then you can read this as well. 
And this is what it took for our project. Uh, the right perspective made for a great adventure. So back to the actual story. Uh, we want this hollow cone of light. Um, this hollow cone of light that we produce with this modified light emitting butterfly architecture is actually really, really exciting. Now you may, may ask why? Uh, what's the perspective here to make good zero nefta possible? And how does it work? And what's it good for? And if you're asking these questions, great, because I'm going to answer them. Uh, but before I answer them, uh, and to not keep the suspense too sort of strong here, to make it bearable, let me just say one more illuminating thing. Um, these hollow cones of light struck us as being really useful for dark field imaging, because that's sort of a light pattern that you need in dark field imaging for microscopes that might not have the infrastructure for doing dark field imaging. But now let's look at this, how this works first. Um, there is three features here that I'm labeling in this, in this little schematic, the break reflector, the light source, for us these are quantum lots, and then the pattern bottom reflector. Now let's start with the break reflector first. And what I show you here is a dispersion diagram. Uh, we show the reflectivity of that break reflector, uh, color coded, black is uh, low reflectivity and gray, light gray is high reflectivity. And we show it against wavelengths of the photons and the incident angle of the photons that are coming from the inside of the device bouncing onto the break reflector. I'm also marking the area with these white dashed lines and the red spots. Uh, that is the wavelength range of our photons. So this is the colors that we emit there from the quantum dots. Now what you get from the break reflector is that, let me see if I, oh, yeah. That actually, what I'm pointing out here, that when the photons hit this at an angle of zero degree, so normal incidence on the break reflector, it's rejecting them, it's not letting them through. You can see this by the overlap between the photonic emission band and the break reflector's reflection band. So what you need to do as a photon, if you want to get out, is you have to find an angle that's a bit more inclined, a higher and higher angle, and then you can get through because now the break reflector is not going to shield you from passing. So the break reflector is like a gatekeeper. It's going to prevent you from getting out if you don't have the right angle. Now, the second part is the quantum dot matrix. Um, this is just our light source. It's cadmium selenide, cadmium sulfide quantum dots. Uh, we get them from Munji Bavendi's group. You can excite them in the blue and they shine light in the red. The third part, that is the flat bottom, or the bottom reflector, I should say. Now, if this bottom reflector were flat, as you see here in this, in this little schematic on the top left, then when you are a photon and you're trying to get at the back reflector at the wrong angle, it just reflects you. And then you're going to find always the same angle as break reflector, so you never get out of this, and you will ultimately be lost at the side of this uh, device. Now that's not good for us because we want to have intensity in the hollow cone. So what we have to do is we have to pattern the bottom reflector, and that means that a photon that takes first the wrong angle onto the uh, gatekeeper onto the break reflector and doesn't come out can change its angle just by interacting with this pattern bottom reflector, and then it might get out on the second, third, or fourth try, and that makes the emission strengths in our hollow cone a lot stronger. You can see this very nicely here in this modeling data. Uh, this is a polar intensity diagram. So you read this as uh, you would read the angles along the circle and the intensity is larger the further you go away from the center of this plot. So you can see very clearly that in the black trace, which is for the bottom reflector, we get low intensity, but in the red trace, which is for our parent micro reflector, well, at the bottom, you get high intensity out of this. Now, what's really exciting is that this works really well in experiments as well. So here is the data that comes from the experiments. You see the flat bottom reflector on the left, black trace in the polar emission diagram, and then you see the patterned bottom reflector on the right, and that's a red trace. You get much more light out in this hollow cone. This also really works well with water as an immersion medium, and water is a really good immersion medium for biological specimen that often reside in water. And you can see there's an exceedingly good match here between theory and experiment. Now, with that break reflector and that emitting layer and the micro pattern bottom reflector, very simple structure, in fact, uh, we can create some really cool optical uh, emission profiles, this hollow cone of light. And I want to show you that it is perfect for dark field imaging. We do dark field imaging without even having any dark field equipment on our microscopes. All we need is um, a blue uh, diode to excite our light source. And then we use a standard microscope and we have to match the break reflector a little bit to the uh, objective's characteristics, namely the numerical aperture. But that's pretty easy. So here's what we see with this approach. Um, this approach we call is actually substrate luminescence enabled dark field imaging or SLED for short. And what I show you at the top left is a bright field image of a single colloid and next to it our SLED image or dark field type enabled imaging. And below that, I show you traces that are taken along these white lines in the pictures. 
And these traces show the bright field intensity variation and the SLED imaging uh, intensity variation. And you can see we have better contrast in the SLED image with colloids, which have a good refractive index contrast to the water imagery image. If we can image one colloid, we can certainly image two or three or seven colloids. Uh, but what's more important is that we can image actually really sort of low contrast specimen, low refractive index contrast, I should say, such as bacteria or little microorganisms. And uh, this is marine microorganisms, a couple of algae that we show you here that we found in Boston's seawater. And it's pretty apparent that the bright field images that you see here and here are relatively difficult to decipher what, what they have as information content, but the SLED images, our dark field technique, uh, can show it very, very clearly. And the contrast in these, in these traces is pretty evident. Now this works really, really well. Small caveat, when we did that, I didn't really understand why it worked so well. Um, so the light that comes from our surface is not really coherent, we checked that. But if it were incoherent, then we shouldn't be able to say a phase object. So why are we able to resolve phase object like bacteria? Now, turns out that this can all be very elegantly explained in the framework of imaging with partially coherent light. So there are components in our imaging game that are important here. And one is the, obviously the light source, our slide surface. The next one that is right far away on my sketch here, but it's really on top of it. I just needed the space for, the, for what's coming on the slide uh, is our object that we wanna see. And here I put a single colloid. And then what you see here is just a simplified version of our microscope imaging system, the objective and the tube lens. And then you have the imaging plane where you would usually put your, um, your camera. And below that, you see this long and beautiful integral that describes the imaging process in this system. Um, what's coming out of this on the end is shown here on the right. That's the intensity distribution in our imaging plane. And we have this fourfold integral, and I'm going to decipher this for you now. But you want to think about this as the response function of our optical system in response to the input object, the phase object. So let me take this a little bit apart. The first thing here that's important is the influence of the object, of our phase object on the light field that we shine on it. And that I call A of X and Y here. Um, we have a phase object, so that has a magnitude of about one, but the phase changes as a function of thickness of this object here, colloid. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Um, the thing that's important in any microscope is what the microscope then does with this information. So what I show you here is the point spread function of our simple microscope imaging system. That would be from a, from a bright field microscope. And um, what that conveys is essentially what happens when you have an infinitesimal small spot of light in the object plane and how that smears out in the image plane. Uh, that's why it's called the point spread function, would be the impulse response function for another engineering system. Now, this J, this factor here, is really exciting in the solar integral. If this were to be unity, then we would actually recover coherent imaging. And we would essentially get the convolution of our uh, phase object with the uh, microscope pointed function. And then we would square it up to get the, uh, the intensity that we see in, in, in our imaging plane. If it on the other side were um, a delta function, this j here, which is called coherence factor, then we would, get, uh, we would recover incoherent imaging. So we would essentially take the intensity of our object and then convolute this with the point spread function of the incoherent imaging system, which is just the autocorrelation of our coherent point spread function. But our J of S is neither. It's not a unity across space and it's not a delta. We can actually retrieve what it is by knowing what the angle spectrum of our light source is. We know in which light, uh, angle range it sends light. And that is akin to the spatial frequencies that it can pick up. I show this here. Uh, this is sort of our angular spectrum of the light source. And a simple Fourier transformation gives us our coherence factor. Now this coherence factor, as you can see, is not a unity, nor is it a delta, it's in between. And that is the coincidence of partially coherent imaging. And because when light comes from the spots on a sample close enough to each other, we have a coherent interaction, we can actually resolve a phase object. And that's what you get out of the imaging plane. This is a little sketch here. So to make this very long story short, um, what we have here is a modeling environment uh, that's actually conceptually pretty simple when you sort of get behind what this integral means. And we can predict how our system, our light source behaves as a function of the design of the bright reflector and the wavelengths of light with which you image. So just to drive this point home, it's very important. Um, excuse me. The key benefit of this technique is that it provides contrast for low refractive index contrast specimen. So, I'm plotting the contrast ratio here. And that contrast ratio is the ratio between the contrast that we get with slat imaging and bright field imaging. 
And you can see that if the refractive index difference between, for example, your, your sample and the environment in which the sample is uh, residing is large, then bright field imaging is actually a bit better. But at the point where your refractive index contrast goes down to about 0 0.3, 0 0.35, uh, you start to see that uh, the contrast ratio shows that slat imaging is significantly better. And especially in the range where you would expect bacteria and cells and other sort of hard to image in bright field specimen, um, we win on this. Now, here's an image that shows different impl implementations of our slat light source with different angular emission profiles and designed for different spectral ranges. And what you can do now is you just put your sample on top of this and you pick the one slat light source that's best suited for matching the objective and the color with which you image or the color that you, that you generate with the surface. And then you can start imaging with dark field without uh, having any dark field equipment, without having any dark field cubes, without having any filters or any of the other pieces that you need to do dark field imaging. There's been a lot of smart students, Cecile and others, and also really bright faculty that have been involved in that project. And we get funding from NSF, ISN, and NIH. This has been a blast. It's been a lot of fun to work on this. And we came a long way from this little butterfly to making this bio-inspired imaging concepts going. Um, but I dare say that this is a useful example of bio-inspired optical design. That's the first part of my talk. Now, let me get back to juggling. And I hope that video plays, because that video is going to show that I can sometimes track it pretty well, but sometimes I mess up. And these are just three balls. Um, there are way more than three interesting projects in my group. So there's a good chance in, in our sandbox of all these different really fascinating projects that I can mess up in terms of juggling time and effort on all projects. And I have gotten very good advice from my mentoring committee and others throughout the years that I should sometimes focus on fewer projects. Um, and I have also been very good in not necessarily following this advice. Um, which might have been a quality at MIT because there is a really important factor at MIT. And I'm, I'm appreciating this now after being here for a while. Um, MIT is full of amazing brains, brains of wonderful humans attached. And I'm lucky to have a small group of, of really smart brains uh, that can juggle a lot of different complicated projects. And I'm showing you two of these smart brains of wonderful humans on this slide here. Um, actually, these are two of my two at the moment most senior, under, uh, uh, most senior credit students, Anthony and Ben. Um, they both happen to answer what I consider the two biggest questions in the evolving field of biological and balanced biophotonics. Um, I think the answers will make this field worth reckoning with for a lot of other scientific communities. Anthony is trying to answer how nature grows functional materials with feature control across all relevant length scales. And Ben is answering how we can actually make copious amount of optically really interesting and useful materials with the required structural control. Now, the real reason why I threw Anthony and Ben into the mix of panels today is that they're the experts on these types of projects. And because they're experts, rather than listening to me, I think you should listen to them. And so for that reason, Anthony will now tell you about his incredible feats of diving into a living butterfly and seeing its form, its optical materials. And then Ben will amaze you with a fresh perspective on a century old approach uh, for scaling colors that stretch. So Anthony, I'm giving this over to you. Please make us see. Okay, now we are going to look at our labs in view of studies of growth of butterfly scale structures. Now, if you look closely at a butterfly wing, you will see that there are hundreds of thousands of scales covering the surface of the wing. And if you look closely at these scales, you'll see that each one is intricately detailed with hierarchical structure. And this structure is what leads to the material functionality Matthias has been referring to. So on, on the right here, I have two images that come from our imaging methodology, and I'll get to that in a few slides. But what's important to know for right now is that every scale is made from an individual cell. What we want to know is how you go from this spheroid blob to this beautiful, wonderfully detailed functional scale structure. And ultimately, we want to know the processes that get us there. But before that, we need to know what morphological changes are actually happening on the scale. We want to see these morphological changes happen. So that's our goal. Now, the butterfly we use is Vanessa Cardi or the Painted Lady. Um, and the reason we use it is because it exhibits a generic scale blueprint that's found across all butterflies. The features that we're interested in are, um, well, here are, here are a few of them at least. On the bottom of the scale, we have uh, lower lamina, which is kind of like a thin film reflector. It's connected to the top of the scale via these struts or trabeculae. 
And the top of the scale is dominated by these ridges, which are themselves made up of um, individual and melee stacked on top of each other. Now, by tweaking and modifying and adjusting different parameters of this structure, you can get the wide range of scales that you find across all butterflies. So for example, if you stack more lamellae on top of each other, you get larger ridges. You can change the trabeculae to make gyroids. You can repeat elements to get more uh, tailored frag reflectors. And you can also change the extents of the scale, change their width, uh, their curvature to add more functionality in the butterfly's natural environment. Now, when we're wanting to understand the growth of these scales, uh, it's helpful to rely on some previous work that has also been asking this same question. And here I'm showing an artist depiction uh, layered above confocal studies that show what kinds of things, what kinds of events we're looking for in the butterfly. At the very early stage of metamorphosis, the wing itself is just a monolayer of epithelial cells. And these cells, the ones that will become scales, produce a lot of actin here in yellow. And this actin eventually is enough to push buds away from the surface of the wing, grow scales, and these grow into their final detailed structure. Of, of course, to see more detailed um, features of these structures, we have to take scales to either an SEM or a TEM. And if we take the exact right time points of a butterfly, if we dissect them at the exact correct moment, we can pick out um, the small changes that might be happening to the ridges during its development. But all of these fixed snapshots are, um, they have something that makes it a little bit difficult to understand the whole range of processes. And in particular, because they're fixed from dead butterflies, we're missing the dynamic and we, we might even be missing the stages that the scales are passing through. We're also missing how to correlate what we see here happening, say for example, on the ridges, to other changes that might be happening elsewhere on the butterfly. So what we want is a continuous in vivo and ideally if we can get it, a label free imaging method so that we can watch what the butterfly is doing and learn the secrets of metamorphosis. And to do this, we teamed up with our collaborators here at MIT to create an in vivo quantitative phase imaging method. Now our lab developed a variety of surgical techniques that lets us see inside the butterfly all throughout metamorphosis. And our collaborators developed a quantitative phase microscope. And by getting these systems to work together, we created a method that allowed us to image the butterfly for 10 days of metamorphosis. That's from the first moments it becomes a pupa all the way until it tries to get out as an adult. And the data that we get out of this has two components. There's an amplitude component and a phase component. And since it's label free, um, we use a variety of processing and visualization techniques to understand better what data we are looking at. So on the left, what I'm showing here is the amplitude data. And this is actually a volume of amplitude data. It's made up of multiple images stacked on top of each other. And in red, we see the slices that are closer to us as the observer and green are the slices of data further away from us. And so this way we can look at a whole volume all in one shot. On the right here, we see the phase data that's been processed to show us the surface morphology of the scale. And so to orient us, we have this key here on the right, which is a cone that we're looking down on. And so white indicates where the cone is sloping down to the left. Black indicates where the cone is sloping down to the right. Now, these two together let us see what the painted is, lady is doing during its development. I'm going to play two movies for you here. Um, and these, these movies are going to show you the growth of a variety of different types of scales. And here I'll point out two. So there are cover scales and these grow a little bit more quickly. They're a little longer and so they're higher up in our volume of data. Ground scales are shorter, squatter, a little slower and they're showing up as green. And so we can see these scales protrude away from the surface of the wing, and we can watch them as they grow and approach their uh, final geometry. We're also able to see features form on the scales as they grow. So on the right here, you can see the fingers beginning to appear on the distal tips of the scales. 
And each of these clips, each one is taken over the course of about a day. So these videos are sped up um, quite dramatically. Now, of course, we would like to look at more detailed features um, beyond these extents of the scale and the fingers at the tip. We'd like to see things like the ridges form. So we need to turn to phase data to look at that a little bit more closely. Here in the middle, we have uh, one slice of data taken out of this volume on the left of a younger scale. And as we look at the surface, the colors indicate that it's a pretty smooth membrane. We can confirm this by um, dropping a trace on top of this data and seeing the actual height of the membrane. And we see indeed it is quite a smooth membrane. And we fast forward maybe half a day or so, and suddenly the phase data, all the scales have these long striations running down the scales. When we drop a trace on these scales, we find that these striations are the beginnings of the ridges appearing on the scales themselves. So the appearance of these ridges really begs the question, um, can we learn something since we have all this data, can we learn something from how they're forming? This is the exact same butterfly, just two slightly different images. The top image shows where there are some lack of smoothness beginning to appear in the surface before the wrinkles come, and then the bottom surface shows where the wrinkles are uh, well spread across the scale surface. And we can look to see what is happening elsewhere in the scale. This Ridge formation all happens around 40% of development of the butterfly. And we can track the relative length of the thickness, the length of the scale, and the width. And we can see the scale's already reached its maximal length, but it's still widening a little bit. This suggests to us maybe two buckets of hypotheses how these wrinkles could be forming. And they're very generalized large buckets, um, but they give us a hint as to how the scale might be making these structures. So to make these wrinkles either the membrane could be growing and being constrained by its environment, uh, the wrinkles would grow up away from the scale. Or it's possible that the surrounding will squeeze the membrane closer together. So the undulations would be getting nearer and nearer to each other. And so as we track these over time, we see that the scale is growing. And initially, this is the unsmooth surface here where the wrinkles haven't completely formed. But once the wrinkles do form, they stay at approximately the same distance. And if anything, they're spreading out ever so slightly. So this gives us a really good, really strong hint that the way these ridges are forming is by the growth of the membrane. Now, everything I've been discussing really focuses on the second quarter of metamorphosis, the second quarter of the butterfly development. There's things that happen at other stages of the butterfly that are really important. So for example, in the early tissue, uh, the way that the cells communicate and divide will really lay the groundwork for the distribution of scales and also the ultimate phenotype of the various scales that we see. Um, the kinds of things we can pick up is mitosis between uh, as the scales begin to proliferate across the wing surface. And we can see philopodia being sent out from uh, cell to cell, potentially leading to cell communication. And also hemocytes that are free flowing underneath the tissue. And in other insects, hemocytes are implicated in um, remodeling of different structures during metamorphosis. And so we can watch um, as all of these changes take place at different ages of the butterfly. Of course, what we're all really here for is the functional structure. And we don't really get to see the manifestation of that until late in development. And I'll just highlight one example here for us, um, which is that lower lamina, the thin film reflector on the bottom of the scale. We can point out here in green where it's being shown, um, and it comes into final shape right around the late stages of, of uh, the pupa. But we can also look backwards in time to see when it's growing and nail the precise times of when the thin film reflector is being made. So from 62% to 85%. So with this treasure trove of data, we can map out a whole range of events that are important for um, the development of the butterfly. And this is made possible due to the new method we have for imaging live insects. It, it captures everything from, like I said, mitosis to the swelling of the precursor cells, the budding of the scales, 
the growth of those scales, and then deformation and feature formation on the membrane that will ultimately be the template for the exoskeleton that gives the final functional structure. Now, we can take this a step further and look at the mechanical phenomena that come out of all of this and come and identify the particular sequence, not just the necessary events, but the sequence of mechanical events that will lead to the structure formation. We can also do the same thing and look at um, the genetics that are driving particular phenotypes. And since we have this map, we can link these phenotypes uh, to particular times and indicate when these genes are operating. And so use this timeline to show us a little bit more about how biology fabricates micro nanostructures. So Anthony showed you how he can see, literally see what happens in the butterfly. And that is something that people have looked at for centuries. How does structural color work? How does it get created? I think he puts the basis there for us to understand what are the biomechanical processes? What are the couplings between mechanics and genetics to be able to create these structures? And so hopefully one day we'll be able to grow them ourselves or to emulate concepts that we see in the butterfly. Now that's not tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So let us switch the perspective a little bit here to something that can happen right now. And that's something that I want Ben to, to show us. Ben is amazing in making something that scales colors that stretch. Ben, that's us with the colors. Right, thank you very much, Matthias. Okay, let me pull some slides up. Okay, there we go. Right, hi everyone, I'm Ben. And I'm going to talk to you briefly today um, about our new technique for manufacturing stretchable, scalable, color changing photonic sheets. Um, in fact, just like the one you can see in this video here. So for reference, this sample you can see, it took between 20 or 30 minutes to make in the lab at a cost of around uh, 40 to 50 cents per square inch. But our technique is amenable to um, adapting to roll to roll processing. And we think that doing so could get those numbers down by an order of magnitude. So before I talk about exactly how we make it, I'm just going to take one quick slide to talk about how it works. So you've already heard from Anthony and Matthias how in nature, quite often color comes not from um, pigment and absorption, but instead through a phenomenon known as structural color. And structurally colored materials consist of um, nanoscale periodic variations in refractive index, uh, otherwise known as photonic crystals, which can do interesting things with incident light. Now, one textbook example of a photonic structure is the Bragg reflector. And this consists of alternating layers of high and low refractive index. And depending on the thickness of those layers, the structure will selectively reflect some wavelengths and let others pass through. Now, if we make those layers out of an elastic material, then whenever that structure is stretched or compressed, the spacing of the structure will change and it will reflect a different color. And this is actually exactly how the material I just showed you works. So moving on to how we make it, the best place to start is actually to explain the inspiration behind it. And that is the work of Gabriel Lippmann. So Lippmann was a physicist and won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1908 for his work on an early type of color photography. And there's a beautiful example of um, a Lippmann photograph on the left here. Now, Lippmann's technique, unfortunately, was not commercially successful, and in the history of color photography is somewhat of a dead end. However, the physics behind it are really cool. So let's say you wanted to take a Lippmann photograph. Well, you need a couple of things, a light source, an object, a lens, and some standard black and white photographic film. So at the moment, this just looks like how you take a regular photograph. But what Lippmann did was add a mercury mirror and the effect of that is that in any region of the image, the light that hits the mirror actually creates an optical standing wave in the vicinity of the mirror. And this selectively exposes the photographic film at the antinodes of that standing wave, which creates this periodic variation in refractive index. And at different locations on the image, which could contain different colors, um, the kind of the length, uh, length scale of that structure changes. And then once you develop the photographic film, these regions that have been um, of high and low refractive index effectively act as Bragg reflectors, and they will reflect the same color of light that was used in the creation of the material. Our technique makes a couple of changes to that. 
we replace the photographic film with a holographic recording material, many examples of which have a good degree of elasticity. We can replace the object with a desktop projector, in this case, just projecting a uniform red image. And we can replace the reflective surface with, for example, just a, an aluminum mirror. We then expose the material to light for anywhere between a few seconds to a few minutes, depending on the output power of the projector. Then we remove the material and add a silicon layer. So that layer does two things. It lets us tune the mechanical properties of the material, and it also provides some absorption of that transmitted light, which improves the color saturation. So I'm just gonna have one quick slide to quantify some of the optical properties of this material under strain. We've got two plots here. The plot on the left so it shows percentage reflectance as a function of wavelength. Each curve on here represents the material under a different amount of strain, going from no strain on the right, which is red, all the way to um, a lot of strain on the left, which is blue. And we can see that it maintains over 90% reflectivity throughout that range. The plot on the right basically takes each one of those individual curves and maps it to a point in the CIE 1931 color space. That effectively translates a spectrum into the color that would be perceived by a human observer. And we see we get this nice smooth loop um, through a number of different colors. However, there are a few other changes we can actually make to our manufacturing technique to get slightly more interesting materials than the one you've seen so far. One thing we can do is modify the projected image. And in fact, by doing so, we can create any color effectively covering the full RGB color space. The sample on the left here was produced by projecting the inset image on the bottom left. And we can quantify that a little bit as well. If we look at the top row, we can see because this is an RGB projector, we have corresponding high reflectivity peaks in the red, green, and blue regions. If we go down to the next row, we get our secondary colors. And interestingly, these are actually combinations of kind of the, the primary color uh, reflectivity. And then we can go down and also get black, grayscale, and, and white values, which are combinations of all three peaks. Uh, and it's interesting to note here that because we, if we control the um, kind of the, the RGB values in the projected image, we can also modulate the intensity uh, of each one of those colors as well. So to demonstrate that we can cover the full RGB color space, as well as the high resolution of this technique, uh, here we have another sample that this time was made by projecting uh, an image of a vase of flowers as, a, as an homage to Lippmann's original work. And here is another sample that is Mickey Mouse. And that will show up again in a couple of slides. So the next question you might ask is, well, what happens when you stretch it? Here we have a larger sample um, with a flower image on it. And as you might expect, it also changes color. However, the color change is now different. And I'm just gonna play this again quickly. And um, the color change is different depending on the original color of that location of the image. But that's not the only thing we can change in the manufacturing technique. We can also modify the properties of the silicon layer. Because the color change is a function of strain, if we tune the thickness or stiffness of the silicon backing layer, we can tune the range of forces over which the color change appears. So in this case, we have a variable thickness piece that changes color by different amounts in different regions. And thirdly, we can also modify the reflective surface. If we use a mirror, like Lippmann did, then the material we get is a specular reflector, i.e. it has a mirror finish. And we have two images of a sample that was made just like that on the left here. Uh, this is the same sample under the exact same illumination, but taken from two different perspectives according to the little cartoons you can see on the bottom there. Now the specular reflecting material, that, that has two effects really. One, it means that the observer, when they look at the material, will actually see a, kind of the illuminating scene of the world around them in that reflection like a mirror. And the other is that if the observer is in the wrong position, then they may not really see much reflection and therefore not much color at all. And so my understanding is that this is one of the reasons why Lippmann photography was unsuccessful, is because to view the photographs, you actually had to very, very carefully control the lighting conditions. However, we actually discovered that if you replace that mirror with a different reflector, something that is a refuse uh, diffuse reflector, for example, brushed aluminum, 
then the material you produce using that actually mimics the reflective properties of that reflector. So we've got another two images here of a new sample made with a diffuse reflector. These were taken under the exact same lighting conditions and perspectives as those two images of the other sample on the left. But now you get this really bright uniform color from a variety of different viewing angles. And in fact, I can just shed a little bit more light on that. These in, this inset image here shows how that light is di distributed. And in fact, the range of angles that it's reflected over. And we can see that we get pretty good, pretty uniform um, light spread over a 100 degree cone. And in fact, if you look at the bottom half of that figure there, you can see that this feature is also preserved under strain. So it also changes color, as you'd expect. Uh, so this is a neat trick, actually, because it's a combination of two things that traditionally are not desirable in precision optics. And that is an incoherent light source and an imperfect um, reflector. However, by using those two, we can actually create materials that, whose appearance is much closer to a lot of the biological examples of structural color that are out there. And in fact, is a lot closer to materials that get their color through um, pigmentation and absorption. And here's a quick video just to show one of these diffuse samples. We can see the color change. And as a side note, you can also um, get a feel for the response time uh, of this material, which is near instantaneous. So finally, just one more slide. Uh, I'm going to talk through a couple of potential applications. Um, and here's Mickey Mouse again. This time, he's been stuck to a Band-Aid. And I'll play this video. So one direction for this, uh, this research is to continue our group's previous work on um, color changing compression bandages. So these allow physicians to precisely apply the correct amount of force when wrapping a bandage, um, yeah, just by, just by observing the color change. But we're also able to actually affix these color changing materials to a lot of different fabrics. So we think that this may open some doors in the areas including fashion and wearables. However, the set of applications I'm personally most interested in use this material in compression, which I haven't shown so far. So I've got two images here, and the, the top, images, top image is what happens when you press a coin into this material. And the bottom image is what happens when you press a fingertip into the material. So what you see here is actually the color, in, color now contains um, a lot of additional information. In fact, it contains information about the surface topography of the object that you've pressed into the material. And it also contains a full map of all the forces that have been applied um, across the whole object simultaneously. And so I'm currently working on a prototype device that uses this capability in combination with a kind of miniaturized digital imaging system together to create a large area, low cost soft force sensor that has high spatial, temporal, and force resolution. And I'm particularly excited to try and apply this device to areas including robotic gripping, as well as new types of input device for human computer interaction. For example, new controllers for virtual reality. So that's everything I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Matthias, I'll hand it back to you. Oh, Matthias, I think you're muted at the moment. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I was looking for words. I wasn't muted. I was not. I was speechless because um, both Anthony and Ben actually put a couple of data sets in there that I hadn't seen yet. Um, that's pretty amazing. So what you saw today uh, was three different um, topics that we're working on in this bigger field of bio-inspired and biological optics and photonics. Um, the bio-inspired imaging concept, the dark field imaging that we got to work without any dark field components, um, that hopefully shows how we can build interesting devices for use in many different contexts, in this case, educational contexts or potentially biology labs, um, by studying nature's light manipulation techniques and building on these insights. The second one was Anthony's amazing feat to look into a butterfly as it sees, as it grows structures and seeing these structures growing. And that forms the foundation for us to understand the biomechanics and hopefully link it to the genetics at some point. And then the last one, what Ben showed you, I think that material is just amazing. Uh, you'll see that very soon. Hopefully we all run around in a dress like this. So you saw two of my students um, presenting today. And I would be 
a miss if I wouldn't show you the whole group. This is an amazing group. There's a lot of really bright people in this group. This is before the pandemic. Um, we just escaped from a U-boat with lots of zeroed nafta. And maybe you figured out what that word really means if you read it the other way around. Um, now we're doing everything a bit more remotely, but this works nevertheless. And this is um, amazing what my students come up with. Um, we got funding from different sources. The other point I want to make is that it's also pretty amazing how uh, faculty interact with my students and my students interact with other faculty. Uh, I have an amazing mentoring team. Uh, George is here that you have seen on the, on the, on the panel, uh, but also Ian Hunter, Roger Kemp, and Peko Hosoy. Uh, they teach me lots of things, and that's difficult because I'm stubborn. And it's been, it's been a great experience. MIT is amazing. So I'll leave you with this. Thank you for your attention today. And if you have questions, we will obviously all three be happy to answer them. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, I, I think it's a bit difficult to applaud in this medium, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I did my best. So let's open it up for questions. I, I think the, the protocol is you raise your hand and then Tony here is watching and will unmute you so you can ask a question. Maybe a last one so we can warm things up a little bit. So, so uh, well, I have to say this is one of the most colorful talks that I ever attended. You know, I'm pretty saturated with color. But I wanted to ask you guys, um, are there limits to the range of colors you can achieve? Could you imagine materials that tune all the way from the ultraviolet, perhaps to the infrared? What are the limits there? Now, who's taking that? Ben, do you want to take it or should I take it? Um, I, I, can, I can I can say a little bit to that. Um, yeah, yeah. We've actually uh, it wasn't in in those slides, but the technique that I showed there. There are a couple of tricks you can do to print directly in the infrared. Um, even if you are using red light, for example, the structure you get will reflect up between seven fifty to eight hundred nanometers. And if you stretch it too much beyond blue, then it will reflect in the UV to a certain amount. Great, thank you. I see Professor Slocum joined the panelist, so it means he has a question. Go ahead, Alex. This is fantastic, and I'm thinking of two, two things. One, you know, like these infrared mouses, and I think it was Microsoft uh, at least pioneered productizing, so the, the mouse will work on any surface, including my jeans or, or anything like that. So what's the potential for these surfaces to become kind of a, a 2D or, or three-dimensional X, Y, theta uh, optical encoders on planar surfaces. And the second question, because there's two of the students, is acoustically. I'm really interested in uh, these insects and butterflies and stuff. Are they using their wings also as like acoustic antennas to pick up vibrations for whatever things? And I will um, mute and listen. I think, Ben, the first one is your question, and the second one is Anthony's questions, I believe. And I can chime in if you need me to. Yeah, so, so, I, so as I understand it, so you're asking kind of, um, it's kind of capability is like an input device, like in what sort of information you can get out of it. Yeah, like an encoder, you know, so when I move across uh, like an optical mouse across the surface, maybe if I put this micro patterning on the surface, it'll give me better resolution as an, an optical encoder. Now, wafer steppers, you know, which are used to make all the semiconductors, they use these 2D encoders. Go look at what Heidenhain offers, for example. And, and now that you said that, now I think of, you know, uh, talk to Kripa Varanasi as to maybe also these it led butterflies shed water. So when they fly, they not, don't get heavy. So there might be something like uh, lotus leafish, lotus leafish properties in addition to optical. I mean, just optical would be boring, right? You got to add other stuff. Yeah, and I think this definitely moves straight into Anthony's area of expertise. Well, for the, for the encoder, there's a few things to say. Alex, optically alone is not boring. Optics amazing. Um, but the other thing, uh, the more serious one, um, you're right, I, I think you could because Ben has this nice sort of capacity of encoding patterns, right? Uh, and that depends on what magnification you put on these patterns. So he can, he can make this flower thing big as your iPad, but he can also make it tiny that you see in the microscope. And so the control of patterns that you see on the surface, it's certainly something that, that could be beneficial. You also mentioned 3D sort of, uh, that you can actually get depth perception, right? And, and there's optics that, that you might be able to do this. We haven't explored this very much. Um, but one thing that 
Roger Cam has been asking uh, on and off uh, is whether we can actually sense in 3D when it comes to cellular forces and stresses and strains and deformations. And we have been working with these fibers for a while. And we're still trying to tinker with um, how we can make these materials so soft that single cells can deform them and how we can then use this in a three-dimensional architecture to make that happen. Hmm. That would be a direct way of sensing forces by color. I think, sorry, I, I jumped well, in. Yeah, there, like, I think you should... Well, remember uh, the polar, uh, where you can buy, you can use plastic when you, uh, the sh in Schlieren photography and you can, you can, yeah, I'm trying to remember the exact plastic. I actually, I think uh, PMMA works quite well. Mm -hmm. right? So you could see the stress patterns, particularly around stress concentrations around holes. It's still valuable. Finite elements doesn't solve all the problems, right? Because the, the plastic where you deform a, the material around the hole, and now I can see on an amazing fine granularity, the, the stress concentration. Great. So yeah. I see Professor Müller uh, has also joined the panelist. So hi, Stephanie. I think oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> okay, Stephanie, just give Anthony a minute. <laughs> okay. Well, so you were suggesting that maybe um, if I interpret your question, maybe these scales can actually be operating as like um, um, earpieces to help pick up different acoustic signals or whatnot. So I don't know of any evidence of that. We know of things working the other way, in fact, where there are particular moths that have very specialized scales that will dampen sound. And so I think the application for there may become apparent is to get away from the bats. Um, so that the bats can't find where these moths are. So they're kind of using it in the reverse. Um, and, but I think you're hinting at this interesting question in addition to interacting with the environment in terms of what they're projecting out to observers, um, can they also be using their scales to pick something up from their environment? And there's not a lot of evidence for that. The only thing is that the scales help with the thermal regulation. But it, you also mentioned the lotus leaf. We, touch mostly on the optical function of the scales, but we can discuss um, we can discuss thermal effects, we can discuss the droplet wetting effects, aerodynamic effects. There's a whole lot of things that the scales are doing on the butterfly surface. It's a beautiful multifunctional structure. Yeah, Professor Lang uh, is doing some fantastic work. Uh, yes. A student I'm helping to supervise on artificial coccyx for the ear. So maybe tap into that. If you send me an email, Slocum at MIT, I'll introduce you to the student we're helping to supervise and everything. Thank you. But then also go talk to folks in Kripa Varanasi's group. Um, we, have a, we have a big field with a lot of butterflies. And even in the rain, when it's pouring down, these things are flying. I'm thinking, how are you guys flying in this stuff? I, you'll, excuse me, I have to go. I have a five o'clock Zoom meeting with one of my student teams in another class. This is absolutely Thank fascinating. You, Alex. Fantastic work, folks. And uh, we'll have, get some real wine as soon as this silly, yeah, COVID's annoyance is over. God, I hate that thing. Everybody does. Yeah, Matthias uh, told me that this is not wine, even though it looks like it is actually black, blue, blueberry juice or blackberry. I, forgot. Yeah, I do blueberry juice when I have to <laughs> drink and leave. Uh, okay, bye-bye. Good work. Okay. S Stephanie, your turn. <laughs> hey, uh, fantastic talk. I have a question for Ben. Maybe you covered it. Can you like tell me again like how you fabricate that stretchable material so you you first have to make the base material and then you project the pattern you want on it. Is, is that, can you maybe elaborate a little bit more? That's actually pretty much it. Um, yeah, you kind of have this, um, this what's effectively a, a photographic film and that will kind of be like a, a blank canvas, so to speak. And then when you project, um, project just an image from a projector onto that, then that'll set up the light that creates these nanostructures inside it that then reflect that color. Okay, super. And, and you mentioned, um, you know, depending on the thickness and some other factors, um, you know, the color change is going to be different when you stretch. Do you, at, at this point, do you have like any sort of like simulation software so you can predict whatever I want to go from this image to this other image or something like this? And then you have to like maybe micro pattern um, to create that stretch pattern, if you know what I mean? It, it, yeah, it's, no, it's, it's a really cool question. And I think it's something that I'm really excited to start exploring at some point. Uh, at the moment, though, we've kept it to uh, uh, kind of the, the really basic examples of just, you know, if it's a sheet and you want to go from, you know, red to blue, you can model that pretty easily. Mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't looked into yet, um, 
yet more advanced modeling or particularly we haven't looked into that kind of inverse design type stuff yet which would be really great yeah start from i want to see this under this strain and work backwards but hopefully we'll have a chance to do that soon okay fantastic and can i can great i chime in on this one um, hmm? joseph has an environment for his fibers he actually created that that thing to an extent where you can at least use it for the specular reflecting multilayers um, so there is there is code that we have and, and that needs to be built out but but it's possible okay fantastic thank you great any more questions for our speaker or speakers rather i think it is friday afternoon and our audience is uh, dwindling rapidly oh i think adios you one hand uh, alessandro parisotto yes please go ahead Have we lost Alexandro or? Hi, sorry, I don't have very good Wi-Fi. I'm in another continent, so I hope you can still hear me. But yes, I had a question for Anthony, actually. Uh, have you looked at the development of the scales of other species or only butterflies? Like, have you looked at things such as beetles, for instance, which also have structural color? Yeah, that's a great idea. So we've stuck with um, butterflies and we've actually stuck with the painted lady for the moment. Um, but once you go to other species of butterflies, we'll see a broader range of structures. And our hope is also to try to do this kind of thing with beetles, because like, like you mentioned, um, you can get a lot of interesting structures on the surface of beetles. They're a little bit different because rather than every single cell making its own individual exoskeleton, um, that's what happens on the butterfly. On the beetle, mm -hmm. all the cells work together to produce uh, a thick sheet of exoskeleton. Um, so the biologically, it's a little bit different, but we're hoping that this kind of approach will help us crack the problem of how are different species making these micro nanostructures. So beetles would be a good first bet. Um, potentially some plants would be another good bet. And Birds are some things that are interesting to look at, but I think that's a little bit more difficult to keep in a dark room for many days. Makes sense. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you for the question, Alessandro. And I suppose this is one of the sort of the one of the compensations for this terrible pandemic that we're in. That because the seminars are all online, it is possible for people from all over the world to participate. That would have been uh, not as easy in the past, I suppose. So thank you for that. And I see Professor Kam uh, posted a comment here. I have a great application for the strain sensitive material. Let's talk sometime. So I am sure all three of you are making note of that. I can follow with Roger. And, uh, and I think we should probably let our speakers take a rest. It's uh, the weekend is starting, even though again with the pandemic, it's not like we can do anything for the weekend. But anyway, maybe you, can just, you guys can just catch up on your sleep. Eh? So thank you very much, all three of you, Matthias, Anthony, and Ben, and all of Matthias' group for a fabulous and very colorful presentation. And uh, I, will, I will applaud on behalf of everybody. So thank you. Thank you very much.